All right, now, before we really get tearing into the wonderful world of Photoshop and start, you know, digging into all the different commands and options and tools that we have available here inside Photoshop, I think what would be extremely important is to take a moment and explain some of the fundamentals here with you, some of the image fundamentals. So this is sort of beyond Photoshop. It's not just related to Photoshop, but I want you to understand that Photoshop is what we would refer to as a rational raster image editor. Now, what does that mean, a raster image editor? Well, I want to talk about the two different kinds of graphics that we have available to us whenever we're working in the wonderful world of graphics. We have raster graphics and we have vector graphics. Maybe you've heard of these terms before. I don't know. But for the time being, forget about JPEGs and forget about TIFFs and forget about EPSs and all this kind of crazy stuff. Forget about all the file formats and let's just focus on raster and vector. And I'm sure by the end of this exercise, size, it'll make perfect sense here for you. So I'm here inside Photoshop. I've launched Photoshop and I went and opened up a photograph of a, a very drafty barn, as you can see here. And as I say, Photoshop is our raster image editor. What does that mean? Well, a raster graphic is a graphic that's made up of tiny blocks of color called pixels. I'm sure you've heard of pixels before. So they're just, imagine like tiny Lego bricks or a mosaic and they all come together to form what appears to be a nice smooth image like a drafty barn, for example. So if I zoom in on this graphic and, you know, don't worry about this for yourself. I haven't talked about how to zoom and different zooming techniques in Photoshop yet. We'll get to that. If you just want to kind of kick back and watch the show for a moment, as I zoom in, you can start to make out these pixels. And now I can start to see pixels here in the barn boards. So they're actually not barn boards. It's just a mosaic tile work of colored blocks that look like barn boards, if that makes sense. These are pixels, right? That's the idea. The closer I zoom in, the more prominent, the more pronounced these pixels are. If I start zooming out, you can see the pixels seem to blur together. And that's actually the human eye, which is just blending all of these blocks of color together to give the illusion of a smooth looking image, right? So that's really what raster graphics are all about. Now, let me jump over to the world of vector graphics for a moment. So vector graphics, it's sort of like the opposite of raster graphics. I happen to have Adobe Illustrator uh, open here in the background. I'll just flip over to Illustrator. Now, if you haven't worked with Illustrator before, I love Illustrator. You can really do some amazing things. Illustrator is what we would refer to as a vector image editor. Well, what's the difference? Well, rather than using tiny blocks of color, this mosaic tile work to create a graphic or to create a cartoon like this cartoon robot, what it does instead is a vector graphic graphic is going to create a graphic out of mathematical lines and curves and shapes and things like this. Now, don't worry, you don't have to break out a scientific calculator to create a shape. It's going to handle all the math for you. But if I start to zoom in on this cartoon here, you'll notice that the lines like the black outline and the color inside and all the rest of it remains nice and smooth. Even when I zoom in super close on this image here, you know, if I start to pan around inside this image, you can see these lines are always going to be nice and smooth and clean. That's the mathematical aspect, if you will, to a, a vector graphic. That's how it works. Okay, so I hope this is happening for you. Let's flip over to Photoshop once again. Now, I'll give you some examples of some raster graphics here. A photograph is a perfect example of a raster graphic. This was a photograph that I took with my digital camera, and digital cameras are always measured. Their qualities are always measured using megapixels, right? Mega meaning millions of pixels. That's the idea there. Things like scans, anything you would scan into your computer, a lot of the content that we see when we're surfing around on the web, graphically anyway, those are all examples of raster graphics. Now, what are some examples of some vector graphics? I'll flip back over to Illustrator here. Well, cartoons are a great example. What I would call line art, if you've seen some blueprints or schematics, things like this. Charts, text is a, a killer example of a vector graphic. If you've ever used text in any application, you've worked with vector graphics, believe it or not. So I hope that makes sense for you.
Now, raster graphics are what are referred to as resolution dependent. What that means is if I take my photograph of my barn here and I try to make it bigger, we'll talk about resizing in just a little while, what happens is the image actually starts to break down. It starts to pixelate because really I'm asking my software, Photoshop, to make up image out of nothing. Imagine if I were to take a, a 5 by 7 photograph and increase it to an 8 by 10. Well, where is it going to get that extra information from? It's got to make it up. That's a process called interpolation or resampling. We'll talk about that. So raster graphics are resolution dependent. And what's extremely cool is vector graphics are what are referred to as resolution independent. So I could take this cartoon robot and I could make him as big or as small as I wanted to. And because he's all based on math, he's going to scale proportionately. He's never going to lose any quality, which is amazing. So theoretically, I could create a poster that would fit on my living room wall out of this, out of this robot cartoon if I wanted to. Whereas again, back in Photoshop, if I increase the size of this photograph, then I run the risk of losing quality. Okay, last but not least, how about some file formats? I told you to forget about JPEGs and TIFFs and all that kind of stuff. Well, let's talk about file formats real quick here. Here's really quickly some raster file formats for you. The native Photoshop file format, .psd, that's a, obviously a raster file format. JPEGs are raster. GIFs, G-I-F, those are raster. TIFFs and sometimes PDFs are also raster graphics as well. There's another file format as well called PNG or ping file. Those are raster graphics as well. Over on the vector side, we have Adobe Illustrator's native file format, .ai. PDFs can sometimes be vector as well, and flash files are also vector. Now, you might use some other programs, maybe like AutoCAD or CorelDRAW. Those are also going to be vector file formats. So there you go. There's a load of information about raster graphics and vector graphics, and I hope it sets the tone for the rest of our time together, because now we understand exactly exactly what we're working with here inside Photoshop. We know we're working with pixels, we know we're working with resolution dependent files, and so on. So now that we're all straight on raster graphics and vector graphics, I suppose the next logical order of business would be a tour of the Photoshop interface. And as you can see, there's a whole lot inside the interface here. So I want to try and break it down for you and I'll, I'll kind of dissect things here for you. So if you haven't launched Photoshop, go ahead and launch Photoshop. And if you'd like, you can go ahead and open up a, an image so at least you can see something. I opened up barn1.jpg. You'll find that JPEG in inside your project files folder. Go ahead and pop that guy open if you want. You just choose file open and then go and navigate to your project files. All right, now in terms of the interface, running right across the top of my screen here, obviously we have the menu bar here, and there's all kinds of different commands and, and options and tools available to us inside the menus. We'll be using a lot of the different menu commands there. If you want, you can pause the video and take a look at some of the different options that we have available inside the menus. You can kind of familiarize yourself a little bit if you like. And then just below the menu bar, at least here on the Mac anyway, we have what's referred to as the application application frame or the application bar. And at least here on the Mac side, we have some icons here. We can launch Bridge, for example. We could launch Mini Bridge. Now, Mini Bridge is something that's new here inside Photoshop CS5. We have some view options here, a little drop-down menu, view extras, so we can get into guides and rulers and the grid and so on. We'll talk about these options in just a little while. We have a zoom option and a few other settings there as well. You can dig into those if you like. And then over towards the right-hand side, we have workspaces. Now, what's a workspace? Well, I want to show you how you can go and create your own workspaces in due time. But essentially what a workspace is, is a, a Photoshop interface arrangement, if that makes sense. So in other words, we have the palettes on the right-hand side, the toolbox on the left-hand side, which palettes are open and how are they organized and all that good stuff, right? So we'll talk about your workspaces. And then below your application bar, we have the options bar. Now, the options bar is kind of an interesting guy here is dynamic and what I mean by that is depending on what I'm doing, depending on what tools I have activated inside the toolbox, I'll see different options available to me on this options bar. 
Of course, I have the main image window as well. And then running down the left-hand side of the screen, we have our toolbox. We'll take a closer look at the toolbox in just a moment. And then going down the right-hand side of our interface, I already mentioned this, but we have our palettes. And of course, we have all kinds of different palettes available to us in Photoshop. We'll take a closer look at the palettes after we take a look at the toolbox. But I hope this at least gives you a, a rough idea of the interface here anyway. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much here. Now what we'll do next is we'll take a closer look at the toolbox and then as I say after we take a look at the toolbox we'll take a closer look at the palettes inside Photoshop CS5. Okay, so let's take a look at our toolbox here on the left-hand side. Now, first of all, don't be overwhelmed by the number of tools that we have available. There's lots going on inside the toolbox here. One neat thing that I can do here is if I hover my mouse over top of a tool, I'm going to get a, a tiny message, which is referred to as a tooltip, telling me the name of that tool. So I had the Move tool there. Now I'm over top of the Rectangular Marquee tool and the Lasso tool and so so that's going to kind of help me along, or help me on my way as I go here. So I could hover over top of a tool and go, oh, right, the clone stamp tool. And then single clicking on that tool actually activates it for me. So I can flip between my different tools and, and so on, right? Now, one thing that I want to mention right off the bat here early on is oftentimes people will say, you know, I don't want the crop tool turned on anymore. How do I deactivate the crop tool? Or, you know, I'm on the lasso tool and I don't want to be on the lasso tool anymore. How do I get off the the lasso tool. Well, you're always going to have one tool activated at a time, right? So to deactivate the lasso tool, just go and select another tool, right? That's kind of the idea. And for some people, it, this kind of throws them for a loop. They go, well, I don't want any tools turned on. Well, then what I usually say is go back to the very first tool, the move tool, or sometimes I just call this guy the black arrow tool. I think of the black arrow tool or the move tool, I think of him as the neutral tool, if that makes sense. So in other words, perhaps I'm all finished with the eraser tool. I'm done, you know, working with that guy. And I want to kind of go back to square one or I kind of want to be at rest for a little while. Well, I would just go back to the, the move tool. And that might seem like a bit of a, a pain in the neck, but, you know using Photoshop for so long, I don't even think about it anymore. It's just second nature. I just go and grab the tool and, you know, that kind of thing. So hopefully that's all good. Now, the next thing that I want to mention is some of the tools, not all the tools, but some of the tools have a tiny black arrow in the bottom right corner. Do you see that in there? There's a bunch of them here right at the top anyway. Now, what that little triangle or that little arrow indicates is that there's more tools hidden underneath this particular tool. How do I get to them? Well, if I click and hold with my mouse, I'm going to get a tool flyout, which exposes the other tools that are hidden underneath the rectangular marquee tool. So once once again, all I do is just click and hold with my mouse and I get this, this tool fly out, if you will. I can go and grab, for example, the elliptical marquee tool. I always just call this guy the circle selection tool. But anyway, we'll talk about these guys in just a little while. So once again, you might want to pause the video and just explore around a little bit on your own. For example, the eyedropper tool has a whole array of additional tools hidden underneath them there. So all of a sudden, the toolbox just expanded. There's, there's even more tools available to us here than we initially thought, right? And again, you'll get used to where tools are hidden and, you know, which tools are where and, and this sort of thing. A neat trick that I can use if I want to go through the different tools that are available to me in a flyout, but I don't want to have to actually click and hold. Maybe you're finding the, the click and hold to be a little bit too, you know, labor intensive. What you can do is on the Mac side here, I'm going to hold down the option key or on the Windows side, hold down alt and then click on the tool and either alt or option clicking simply cycles you through the tools that you have available to you underneath that little flyout menu. Just a a neat little trick that you might want to try out there on your own. And this kind of delves into power mode user, but you might want to jot that down in your notes. It's a neat little trick to remember. Here's another neat little trick that I want to show you. You may have noticed that as you're hovering over top of your different tools, not only do you get this tool tip, but did you notice that there's a single character in brackets at the end of the tool tip? So for example, crop tool there had the C inside the bracket there. There he is. Now what that means is that's a keystroke shortcut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the C key on my keyboard. I'm 
not holding down shift or control or command or option or anything like that. Just C all by itself. So I tap the C key and that flips me over to the crop tool. Now these are called keystroke equivalents or keystroke shortcuts. I could hit the V key for the black arrow tool. That's another one that I use all the time. So most of the tools inside the toolbox have keystroke equivalents. And I'll admit, I don't know them all, but I know the ones that I use all the time. M for the marquee tool, L for lasso, H for the hand tool all the way down towards the bottom, the Z key for the zoom tool, P for pen, and so on and so on, right? I won't bore you to death with all of the ones that I know here, but anyway, you might want to use those guys as well. All right, now two more quick things to show you here. Way down towards the bottom of the toolbox, we have a color area. We have our foreground color and our background color. We'll talk about working with color later on. And the very last thing that I want to show you, very simply, is this double-headed arrow right up at the top of the toolbox. I can click on that guy to collapse down my toolbox like this, or click back on him to give me this single-column toolbox. So if you want the double column or the single column, it's really entirely up to you. Now, how about the palettes running down the right-hand side of our, our screen here? There's obviously lots and lots of palettes here. What we can do is we can take any set of palettes and we can flip through the different palettes that we have available inside that palette group. So, for example, down at the bottom here, I have layers and channels and paths all grouped together there, and I can simply flip between those different palettes just by clicking on the different tabs. And that, of course, goes for all of the palettes that we have available to us here inside Photoshop. So, across the top here, I have swatches and styles and info. Now, you might have a slightly different layout to your palettes. Don't worry about that so much if you do, because what we can do is we can start to customize our interface just a little bit and I'll show you how to do that it's kind of cool now what I do want to mention though too before I really delve off the deep end into the topic of palettes is if you head up to your window menu up at the top what we get is a full laundry list of all of the available palettes that we have here inside Photoshop so really what we see on screen here is just a small amount of all of the available palettes. So we have a 3D palette, we have actions, we have brushes and brush presets and all the rest of it there. If I want to go and open up one of these palettes, all I do is choose them out of the menu here. For example, I'll choose Info, and that'll open up the Info palette there on the right-hand side. Sometimes the palettes open up on the right-hand side, sometimes they wind up in the middle of your screen. It all depends on your particular setup. Now let me show you some of the common elements between a lot of the palettes. I'll use my swatches palette, for example, here. I'll just flip over to swatches here. Now a lot of the palettes that we have here inside Photoshop have icons running across the bottom. Not all palettes, but a lot of them have these icons. For example, there's the swatches palette icons, or way down at the bottom, there's the layers palette and all the icons running across the bottom there. So that's sort of a common element that you'll see between the different palettes. The other thing that the palettes all have in common is they all have a drop-down menu right up in the top right corner. That, this is what's referred to as the palette menu. So right now I'm going to pop open the swatches palette menu. Now each palette has a different set of commands depending on that particular palette's function. For example, swatches obviously deals with color. So I get a lot of color related commands inside the swatches palette menu. If I head down to character, for example, and I pop open his palette menu, I get a lot of font and text related options inside his menu, right? That's kind of the idea. So each palette serves a very specific function, a very specific purpose. Some of the palettes, I I will say this, you'll use all the time. For example, layers, you'll use layers every single day. But other palettes tend to come and go. You might not use the character and the paragraph palettes, for example, very often, right? So what you can do in that case is you may decide that you don't want to have them on screen. So what you can do, and this is kind of neat here, is you can take the actual palette tab there, paragraph, right-click on that, 
right on the tab there and simply choose close and that'll close out of that particular palette right I'll do the same here with character I'll right click and I'll choose close and that goes for all the other palettes as well now what if I actually want to use the character or the paragraph palette well I can head back to the window menu and then simply look for character there's my character palette or my paragraph palette and I can always pull them back I can always retrieve them right so they're simply closed they're not disabled entirely. I'm going to go and close out of my paragraph palette there. So I hope that makes sense. Let me show you uh, one other thing here as well. Earlier you saw how we could expand and collapse the toolbox over on the left hand side. Well we can do the same thing here with our palettes on the right hand side. So much like the toolbox we have a white double headed arrow right up at the top of our palettes. If I click on this guy what happens is all of my palettes now collapse down to the right hand side and I'm left with icons. Almost like the toolbox so if I hover over top of these icons I'm going to once again get a little tooltip here that tells me exactly what palette that is so there's my layers palette for example click on that guy and now the layers palette flies out he expands out into the middle of the screen and I could work inside the layers palette for example and then once I'm finished there just click back on the icon and that collapses them back down. So it's entirely up to you if you want to work in this fashion or if you'd like to expand the palettes back out, maybe something like this, right? Or what you could do is you could have sort of a combination of the two. I'll collapse this guy down and then this left hand edge right here, I'm going to drag on that and that'll let me expand this guy out just a little bit. So now I actually get these larger buttons with the, with the actual palette name there. So that's another way to work. It's entirely up to you how you want to work. And one of the great things about Photoshop is you can really customize the interface and really set it up to suit the way that you like to work. Earlier, I'd mentioned the options bar that runs right across the top of the Photoshop interface, and I made mention of the options bar being dynamic. Now, what that means is, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is essentially when I'm working with different tools inside the toolbox, when I'm working with different commands and options, the options that become available on the options bar across the top here is going to change. So right now I find myself on the move tool. Go ahead and choose the move tool yourself if you like. And then you'll see the same options across the top of your screen that I see across the top of my screen. Now most of the options here are grayed out for the moment, but let's try a couple of different things here if I now switch to the marquee tool the rectangular marquee tool there in the toolbox second tool down I now get a completely different set of options running across the top of my interface now probably the best option or the the best example I should say of the options bar in action is when we're creating text now we'll talk about working with text and creating text much later on but let me do this I'm gonna go and grab my type tool out of the toolbox go ahead and grab that guy and now what I get across the options bar is I get a font menu, a font drop down menu, just like you'd see in a lot of word processing applications, a style menu for the particular font, size, I have my anti-aliasing drop down menu, alignment, color, and so on, right? So you might want to take some time and try selecting some different tools and keeping your eyeballs up on the options bar to see what options present themselves. And as we go along together, you'll see a lot of the tools and the options working together when we're completing various tasks. Now that we're through the discussion of the interface, the toolbox, and the palettes on the right-hand side and so on, what I thought I would do is mention a couple of quick ways that you can work inside the Photoshop interface. And I think that you'll really like this, especially once you get more and more used to working inside Photoshop. So here's what I'd like you to try. Whether you have an image open or not, try this. Try hitting your tab key on your keyboard, whether you're on a Mac or a PC. And what that does is that temporarily disables the toolbox on the left hand side and the palettes on the right hand side and that option bar that was running across the top of the interface I'm sure you remember that guy so simply tab and then to bring everything back to life just hit tab again and we're back to where we started now why is that cool why is this useful well oftentimes I'll be zoomed in nice and close on an image maybe I'm doing some color correction or maybe I'm doing 
doing some cleanup or, you know, something like this. And the interface is just too cluttered. There's stuff in the way, and I can't really see my image very well. All I want is just a little bit of elbow room inside Photoshop. So to get that extra elbow room, all I'm going to do is simply hit the tab key. And now it's almost like I'm working in this. It's almost like a full screen view, isn't it? Now I have a lot of screen real estate here to work around inside my image and to, you know, manipulate my image and, and see what's happening and then bring everything back just by hitting the tab key again, right? So very cool. Now here's something else I want to bounce off of you as well. Maybe I want to work in more of a full screen capacity, but I want to keep my toolbox turned on on the left hand side. So in other words, I don't want to turn off the toolbox. I simply want to get rid of the palettes temporarily on the right hand side. Try this. Try holding down the shift key and then hit the tab key on your keyboard. And what that will do is that will temporarily disable the palettes on the right hand side. So I still have all of my tools available to me, which is great, but now I have sort of this larger screen real estate that I can take advantage of, which is which is great. Shift tab to bring everything back on the on the right hand side. So there you go. There's a couple of neat options there for you. And you know this almost goes without saying, but I'm gonna bounce this off you as well. This is kind of getting into the power user area of Photoshop, but give this a try. I'm going to hit tab on my keyboard, it turns everything off. And then what I'll do is I will hit the H key on my keyboard. And what that does is that flips me over to the hand tool. So if I hit tab again, just for a second to bring my toolbox back, that actually flipped me over to another tool inside the toolbox. So in other words, while the toolbox and the palettes are turned off or visibly disabled, I can still make use of all of my keyboard shortcuts. I could hit the V key on the keyboard to switch to the move tool or L for the lasso tool or P for the pen tool, which is very cool. I'll go back to my move tool just by hitting V here. Or give this a try. I'm going to try hitting F7 on my keyboard, and that'll bring up my layers palette for me. This is something that I haven't mentioned yet, but a lot of your palettes inside Photoshop have keystroke equivalents as well. So you can hit F7 for your layers if you want. Try hitting F8 for your info palette, or hitting F8 once again will disable the info palette. Hitting F7 again will disable the layers palette and so on. Now, again, I don't know them all, but I know the ones that I use most often. I just hit F6 on my keyboard, and that was for the color palette. Oftentimes, though, I make use of my layers palette, and again, that's F7. So there you go. There's lots of neat ways to work here inside Photoshop. I just hit tab here again to bring everything back to life, and we're ready to continue on.